everyone. Uh, this is Steve Marinucci, um, freelance writer for Billboard magazine and Access.com, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, our weekly no holes barred discussion where we talk about the Beatles past, present, and hopefully to come. Let me introduce uh, who's on hand with us tonight. Uh, we're missing one person, but hey, we're going to do it anyway. Um, first of all, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, where the Democratic National Convention is going under hot weather, I understand, is... 88, uh, 88 degrees. 88 currently. degrees? Currently? currently? That's, not what I heard. That's not what I heard on TV. I heard it's hotter. But anyway... Um, in Philly, it may be. Oh, okay. Mr. Uh, our uh, Beatle fan executive editor, Mr. Al Sussman. Uh, good evening, Al. Hey, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And down in cooler, I assume cooler Connecticut... It's in the 80s here. It's in the 80s there? Yeah, yeah. okay. The host of the of Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Good evening, Ken. Hi, Steve. How you doing? I'm fine. And joining us from Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. Um, I, that, I, do, not do, I do not do Frank Sinatra very well. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> is uh, uh, author, Beatle fan author, and Beatle author, I should say, uh, who has written... Um, uh, her own books and has a column on the Beatles. Um, Kit O'Toole. Good evening, Kit. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Hey, hey Kit. Kit. Let's first talk about um, a couple of things that have happened this week. Actually, I'm going to go back to something last week that we discussed, where we discussed the um, the Love Show, and Alan talked about the the instrumental tracks at the beginning of the show, which if you get there early. You can hear some interesting tracks, and with Alan's help, um, I have a list of of the tracks that were played before the 10th anniversary show. I'm not sure if this is all of them, but this is most of them. They played Got to Get You Into My Life, Girl, and Your Bird Can Sing, with a little help from my friends, Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except Me and My Monkey, Penny Lane, which I remember Alan praising, and it... And, mm. And it, it is very nice. Sun King and Mean Mr. Mustard, and I Love Her, I'm Only Sleeping, and it ended with uh, You Never Give Me Your Money uh, with the count with the count in at the end, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh. So that was uh, what they did. And so, in other words, if you're going to go see the show, get there early so you can hear that. Because as uh, I did not hear all of those because I was out on the red carpet and got in at the kind of at the last minute, but he did because he didn't come out on the red carpet. So, anyhow, how do we know that they're going to play that before every show? Maybe it was just mm. for this special occasion. That's a good question. I I honestly don't know. I'm uh, I would think that they would play stuff, something like that before every show. I would guess, but I mean, obviously, if, if, you know, if people go to the show and they and they don't hear those, you know, let us know. But that's what they did play before the tenth anniversary show. Mm-hmm. And these were strictly instrumentals. They were stri- strictly instrumentals. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's interesting. Just the backing tracks, just the backing, yeah. Just the backing tracks, yeah. Backing tracks, right? Interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. and he pretty much had the changes uh, in the show from the original to the later show pretty much down uh, pat. The the one thing you know the he mentioned uh, Octopus's Garden, which of course Paul and Ringo joked about at the end, which was definitely new. And they they, uh, the, they had the studio twist and shout taking out uh, I am the walrus, which I'm curious why they did that. Uh, yeah. I would have thought I am the walrus would have been great to keep in there, but in any event. So there we go. There uh, uh, that was, and they also had before Octopus's Garden. They played a little bit of Good Night, uh, a, a, a different version of Good Night. Uh, so that was kind of interesting too. But anyway, that, uh, there are a couple of changes in the new show. And they also had "Hey Jude," by the way, too, uh, in the yeah in the new sh- in the show. So, anyway, um, okay, enough about that. Let's uh, the big news of the week, of course, was Hollywood Bowl, uh, the release of the Hollywood Bowl um, finally coming on CD for the first time. Um, although, if you've been, if you attend uh, record shows or st- or you know various Beatle events, you've probably seen Hollywood Bowl or on Amazon. Uh, 
it's been on CD and in an authorized versions, but it's finally going to come out in an authorized version. And they went back to the tapes, and and I and I wrote on Facebook that you know it was it was weird when I went to the Capitol Studios uh, a few you know a month about a month or so ago, seeing those tapes on the shelves, and uh, have have that announcement come out. I I honestly obviously those tapes on the shelves since they do everything at Abbey Road are may have been only copies or whatever of the of the uh, the actual tapes but it was interesting to see that after what had happened but i'm you know um there have been comments people complaining i i for one am glad this is coming out the album should have come out a long time ago as i said in a couple of places i would have loved to have seen a deluxe version with at least two of the shows because the third show had sound problems but maybe they could. I don't know if they could have rescued the third show, and that's why they didn't do it. But I'm, you know, I'm I'm glad this is out. Uh, I think Alan Alan talked about the cover and said he thought the cover was terrible because it matched the the uh, uh, movie uh, poster. And um, hopefully they've kept the original cover in there somewhere. But I mean, how do you guys feel about this, uh, uh, Ken? Let me start with you. Well, on the one hand, uh, I'm just thrilled that it's coming out because it's been long out of print, period. Um, came out in 1977, and I think it's been out of print since the mid-'80s. Um, and just to have this come out with improved sound quality, and we do have four bonus tracks, although mm-hmm. I was expecting every time there's some new release, so many Beatle fans are going to complain no matter what. Yeah, I'd like to <laughs> see more of the Hollywood Bowl concerts, more of them. But as I've said many times here on this show, the Beatles themselves don't cater to the hardcore fan. And um, I think that one aspect of the Beatles' history that isn't given nearly enough attention through the Beatles' own fault, really, is how great they were as a live band. And, you know, part of the reason why I'm sure this documentary is being made is for that reason, although it's taken this long to do such a documentary. But um, there's so much great stuff that could come out live, and we've talked about this many times, even on video, um, and yet it takes forever for this stuff to come out. But the Beatles themselves, I don't think, really care all about that. What I wish they would have done, and I'm, like I said, I'm just glad for the sake that it's coming out, is that if you were to take all the, the shows they did in 64 and 65, there should be one song, one recording of each song to represent both years. And there's still four songs that they performed between the one show in 64 and the two in 65. Four songs that are not represented at all. So I'm glad that there are the bonus tracks. Don't get me wrong, but I wish that, um, you know, I wasn't expecting two complete shows, but it would have been nice if every song was represented. So you would have, you would have been okay with taking a song out of various shows and, and putting them together? Yeah, well, that's what the album was in 77. You know, I, I prefer a full, complete show in the order that they perform them in, but mm-hmm. I don't mind them this way. I mean, they're still great, seg together this, the way that it was anyway on the album. The mm-hmm. songs are great no matter how you seg them together. It would have well, been great yeah. to, to do it as they did it live, you know, because that's the way it mm-hmm. was. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, songs are great songs by themselves no matter how you mix them together right um i i don't know that i would have gone to to a whole bunch of different shows i like the fact that they stuck with the hollywood bowl i was actually listening to the um lineup because i did a a fake lineup from my you know collection and your I, your comment about them being great as the live band is is very true and the song that really indicated that is roll over beethoven when at the end they start they really jump into it i don't know if you guys remember how they did that they they really kind of jump into that at the end and paul really goes up on a little louder on the on the harmony it says roll over beethoven and they really put do the uh, go in really heavily on the guitar and the band really rocks on, on that particular song and that's one instance where you are exactly right that mm-hmm. they were they were a very good live band. Um, I you know um, it, it'll be it'll be uh, obviously it'll be interesting to see 
what happens. Um, they on the on some of the stuff I've seen or heard, I should say, the sixty four stuff is in mono, and I believe it's it's also in stereo in other places. So it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to see what they end up with, and you know, and 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 obviously the the tapes that they found and how much better. I mean, the technology advances in the years can only can only help. Mm-hmm. Um, Al, Al, what do you think? Uh, you know what Ken was saying is uh, is very valid. I think a lot of people were kind of expecting that there would be a number of different tracks from different shows, since that's basically what this film is about. You know, an overall history of of the Beatles as a performing band. But I think what happened was that once they discovered, uh, once Giles Martin discovered that there were still these three three track masters of the Hollywood bowl shows of the, uh, the, the, the 64 and 65 Hollywood bowl shows that obviously the decision was made to simply go with those recordings, make, you know, uh, make a, you know, a really good audio version, a very listenable version of that concert or those, you know, that that mm-hmm. album, the, 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 the 77 album plus plus the four bonus tracks. I think, you know, that's, you know, that's the decision. And I think a lot of people, uh, especially like you, Steve, and like and like Ken and probably Kid as well. Um, have been have been waiting for the release of the Hollywood Bowl album in some digital form for for a long time, and I'd say that most of the uh, you know the the what you might call the rank and file Beatle fans uh, are very much in favor of it, even even though they have some quibbles about the cover, about the fact that the cover is is a uh, a tie-in with the movie. But then mm-hmm. you've got of course course all the gloomy gusses who are uh you know going on about how uh how uh, terrible this is and they should have uh, they should have gone all out and done a multi-disc package of all of their all of the concerts that are currently available and da 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 and of course that wasn't going to happen mm-hmm. uh so i think uh, i think this is probably the uh the best the best strategy is to put this out as a as a prime example of what the Beatles were like as a performing band. You know, even the, even in '65, you know, obviously Shea Stadium uh, there because of the size of the crowd and the fact that the Beatles themselves are almost spectators to this huge event and. Plus the fact they couldn't hear themselves, uh, their performances were not that great. But with Hollywood Bowl, even in 65, it's a smaller crowd. They could hear each other, so the performances are much better, and certainly mm-hmm. the 64 performances are. So, you know, I, uh, I think that's probably, probably their best uh, to tie in with the film. I think that's probably their best strategy is to, is to go with a, a reissue, a remastered reissue of Hollywood Bowl. And I think that if they hadn't done that, you would have had people – Asking for you know why didn't you do Hollywood Bowl? Yeah. I, I got to say in in the as far as the track list goes, the one song that's glaringly missing for me is I'm Down. Why they didn't put I'm Down? Because they there is an I'm Down from '65, and right. why yeah. they didn't, why they didn't do that I I don't know. Kit, what do you think? Well, you know I think Al really nailed it on the head when you said you know this is really it's a, it's his it's a piece of history. You know, I mean, this really gives you an idea, I mean, for, you know, someone like me who wasn't lucky enough to be there that, uh, you know, this is what they sounded like. This was the experience of a Beatles concert. Now, on the other hand, I've been thinking about this ever since this news came out that, you know, this isn't an album that I've I've repeat, you know, gone back to repeatedly. Um, you know, I did buy it uh, on cassette uh, in the mid '80s, <laughs> uh, probably about, you know, like the yeah. I mean, that's that's a, it's certainly uh, worn out, but it is something I haven't gone back to a whole lot, and I think partially because of the sound quality. I mean, I think you know the the constant screaming and so forth. But I am really interested to see or hear what they're going to do with these new mixes. I I know they shouldn't 
absolutely cut out the crowd sound because, again, that's part of the experience. This right. is part of the historical mm-hmm. document to give you that idea, you know, what it was like. So definitely keep some of it in, but I'd love to see it or, or hear it toned down just a bit so you can, you know, the instruments and the vocals can be higher in the mix. Uh, so I am very, very intrigued to, to hear what this is like. The only thing that's bothering me a bit about the the, the way they've, um, you know, like the press release that's come out is they keep saying this is a brand new album. You know, they keep saying, claiming this is a brand new album. Well, it really isn't. I mean, the new tracks, of course. I mean, that's that's different from the original. But, you know, it bothers me a little that they're not really saying what it is you know which is more of a remaster you know reissue but it's a little quibble and yes i don't like the cover art either but i see what they're doing they're trying to tie it into the movie Mm -hmm. and sell more copies let's face it you know that's what it is and that's their marketing yeah and you know Mm -hmm. it was funny the press release made no mention as i can recall from writing it uh, from writing off of it that it was on CD for the first time, and that's the I mean that's a that's a blaring thing to anybody that has been waiting for this thing for you know for how God knows how long you know. I that's mean, this a very is good point. This is something that we've been that that has been when any any time we've you know you've asked you know you do these stupid you know what things do, do you want the Beatles to release the Hollywood Bowl was. Uh, always one of the top two things that people you know in, in any time you ask beetle fans what they wanted released that was one of the top two things and the other one of course is let it be on dvd mm-hmm. which god knows we may get you know maybe we'll get be getting that eventually but uh you know but yeah i mean uh, this has always been something really you know high on the list and i think that's for that reason they had to go with hollywood bowl and not do what can suggest it is you know, uh, is put, uh, you know, different tracks because, you know, this is something that people have always, have always wanted. I re- I remember actually, I don't know, uh, you know, how you guys, if you guys do cutout bins, but I remember finding a copy in a cutout bin one time in a supermarket for six ninety nine. I think it was a vinyl, obviously a vinyl copy. Mm-hmm. And, um, which uh, which was kind of strange, but um, oh, excuse me, I'm indulging in nostalgia right now for hearing the cutout bin. Gosh, <laughs> I remember mm, that. Really? <laughs> wow, good memories. I know, I know. A good part of my collection came from there. Yeah, yes. you oh, bet. Yes. Oh yeah. You know, uh, another thing is that uh, I've always felt that we all know that there's so many things that are in the vaults that could come out that we feel should come out, although the Beatles themselves don't feel that way, but definitely Mm -hmm. the things that have been released before that have been out of print shouldn't take this long, you know, for it to be re-released, you you know, as well as let it be. There's no reason why Live at the Hollywood Bowl should have been out of print all these years. So, um, you know, I do feel that way. But one more thing, and that is that, you know, since the Ron Howard film is coming out, I would have thought, yes, I know Hollywood Bowl as an important release. But with all that said about the 65 Shea show, you know, why can't that? I would think so many people point to that as being such a pivotal moment in rock history, the first stadium show, what gave birth to stadium rock shows. And it was a great performance. And No, it, thought, no, it wasn't. I think it was. I've seen it. I've watched it. You know, I think they were great. They were spectators. They're they're standing there and they're just watching this crowd, and they can't hear each other. And uh, you know the so met, especially in comparison to the performances from the Hollywood Bowl show, what six days later, whatever it was, you know where they could where they could for the most part hear each other, you know, the, and plus the fact that with Shea Stadium, a good portion of what was in the actual film was overdubbed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very illusory, you know, whereas at least with, at least with Hollywood bowl, you know, you're getting the actual performances, you know, I think uh, probably for, yeah, probably for Shea stadium. I mean, I think you make a a good point. I, I think it probably would be better appreciated as, you know, the film. I mean, you know, because when you see it, maybe, 
if if you he- just hear it, I don't think you get a sense of mm-hmm. what that whole atmosphere was like. Yep. And, you know, when John was going crazy, you know, <laughs> during I'm Down, I mean, it was just great, great. Mm-hmm. I love that part. Um, but, you know, and you see the everyone sweating. And, I mean, it, it just was just an incredible event. And so probably that would be better served as a, you know, remastered, reissued DVD rather than just a standalone CD because you Audio, don't get the full yeah. That's effect. what I was thinking all yeah. along. I, I can't imagine yeah, right. Stadium coming out strictly as audio. You have to right, watch right. it. That's oh, part of okay. the excitement. Right. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, maybe the Hollywood Bowl thing is... I mean, there is a Hollywood Bowl f- film out there. Right. Um, I assume you guys have seen it of the whole 64 show and it's and it's it's great and another quibble i think that people have had is why didn't didn't they put that out but on the other hand and i'm not and i don't want to get any people anybody you know thinking uh, this is more than just a suggestion because it it isn't but maybe that this is not the end of the live releases maybe Mm -hmm. they will maybe they will do something Mm -hmm. else maybe even this year i don't know and well, I, I swear to it, I swear to you, I do not know. It's but possible. Just, it's possible. Because in fact, right. our our friend Tom Frangione uh, made this point to me yesterday that it's possible that if assuming that the film is going to be released in some form, either on DVD or Blu-ray, that may, perhaps at that point. Apple may put out yet another companion that might be more of a closer to what Ken was talking about, you know, a mm-hmm. kind of a, 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 a compilation of performances. Mm-hmm. Maybe even put out Shea because we know they have that. Right. You know? mm-hmm. Right. So the possibilities are endless. And again, I want to caution those of you listening that we're just playing guessing games here. This is not exactly not. This is not inside information that we are, you know, so don't start counting down to uh, or contacting uh, anyone and asking because we don't know. But, I, I, you know, that possibility uh, does exist. On the other hand, however, there is the stumbling block of you have to get all four people in the in the beetle hierarchy to agree and that has mm-hmm. always been always been mm-hmm. an issue you know i was sitting here thinking while we were talking about this the reason that maybe hollywood bowl came it took so long was not because of quibbling but because they knew all along they were going to do something like the ron howard film and they just waited for the opportunity to do that and that was the quote-unquote excuse to finally do this so it's i don't possible. you know I, that, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, that, that's just a theory. I, I don't know. Possible. So, so I would anyway. add, though, uh, you know, as far as what Al said about the Shea performance, I still think that it was a magnificent performance. It's not just a visual thing. Mm-hmm. When you consider the fact that they couldn't hear themselves to perform as well as they did, they still sounded pretty darn good to me. And, and that, even when that, you mm-hmm. listen to the real act naturally, as mm-hmm. opposed to when it was dubbed in, you know, right. there, was mm-hmm. a, there was a flub in the beginning with Ringo, but overall his vocals were fine. Mm-hmm. So when I've listened to Shea, mm-hmm. I've been quite pleased with it. So, and that I'm down, that I'm down with the elbow is is yeah. wonderful. When, yeah, I mean that is absolutely a, a crowning moment in in Beatle history. I mean, just for him, the way he did that, you know, it's absolutely stunning. I mean, that's just so hilarious, and especially when you see it on mm-hmm. even hearing it, you don't even have to see it. Just hearing it is is <laughs> is really so cool. Anyway, let's go on to talk about beetle fan and talk about kit's story um kit why don't you give us a rundown on exactly what the story was well about. well first before before she does that let me just put in uh, <laughs> some plugs here Kit's going to be appearing uh as a guest at the the fest for beetle fans in chicago at the uh the hyatt regency o'hare the weekend of august 12th 13th and 14th and uh, Kid actually will be doing something each of the three days on Friday evening. Well, actually, let's backtrack. Sunday evening or Sunday Sunday afternoon, she's going to be doing um, a, a discussion with uh, our friend uh, Robert Rodriguez about cover versions of the Beatles covering rock and roll. 
because mm-hmm. Kit has done a series of mm-hmm. pieces on something something else. What is it called? Something else. Uh, something else <laughs> reviews. That's it. Something mm-hmm. else reviews um, yeah. uh, about various cover versions of Beatles songs. So I've asked her to c- come up with. You know, maybe a dozen, maybe a baker's dozen of uh, of those of those cover versions. And she and Robert and I uh, will uh, will be talking about that on Sunday, Saturday afternoon. Kit, one of basically Kit's regular column for uh, something else is called Deep Beatles. And so she's going to be doing something that she did in New York with uh, Scott Erickson, a kind of a live version of Deep Beatles, in which Kit will talk about various tracks and Scott, uh, Scott will, you know, musically interpret what she's just been talking about. Yeah, we had a great time doing this yes. in New York and the crowd really loved it. So we're, we're doing it again. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Friday evening... Along with uh, Kit will be on stage in the in the main ballroom, along with uh, a bunch of us um, uh, for the what they call the meet the guest authors, and uh, but then a little bit a little bit later in the authors room, Kit's going to be uh, Kit and uh, Wally Pedrasic are going to be talking about this piece, which uh, which I'm about to hand over to, to Kit to talk about, which is in the brand new issue. Well, it's not brand new now. Uh, it's in the current issue of Beatle Fan Magazine, and it's a piece about the, well, it's basically the, the title is taken from Martian, Marshall McLuhan and his theory of the medium is the message, and it has to do with John and Yoko and the peace campaign. And I'll just let Kit take the ball. Well, thank you, Al. Well, yeah, yeah it's <laughs> – wow, that was quite an introduction. Okay, well, anyway, uh, yeah, this is this is a piece that I've been – yeah, I've been working on this on and off since actually last year um, at Beetle Fest where I was on a panel with Jude Kessler, and we were talking about John's protest songs. And right. I brought up – which I was afraid I, I was going to have, you know, rocks thrown at me when I when I brought this up, the audience, where I said some of his best protest songs, really, he appropriated advertising tropes. You know, he, he took the format of the slogan and the jingle, and instead of, as he, he said himself on the Dick Cavett Show, instead of selling soap, we're selling peace. You know, and I said, now, before you all say, how dare you suggest, you know, that that John would ever do something, you know, appropriate something that, well, literally commercial to, you know, create something this this artistic. I said, you know, hear me out. What he wanted to do in songs like Give Peace a Chance, uh, Happy Christmas War is Over, Power to the People goes on and on. He came up with. A, a memorable slogan that we can all remember, you know, sets it to music and then uses the sort of the format of the jingle. You know, what is what do you uh, what does a jingle accomplish? Well, it grabs your attention in some way, you know, maybe emotionally, you know, you are or just somehow sonically, but it somehow connects you. So it gets your attention. It then advertises, of course, the product you know, uh, whatever it may be, and imprints it in your memory through music, again, through that emotional connection. And then by the end, the jingle is telling you to do something, you know, now, normally, this would mean, of course, buying the product. But in this case, what John did to sort of turn it on its ear is to say, I want you to either to go out and whether it's, you know, protest, um, you know, uh, participate in activism, or to even just change your mind. And this is another interesting aspect of, of what he's, he did in his music, is he recognized that if, you know, to ask people to change their minds about something, that's asking a lot. Let's face it, and we, we certainly know this in this current political climate we're in, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> that people's minds aren't easily changed, you know, and so... Mm-hmm. He was, um, there, I came across a wonderful term, and I, I, I'm blanking out on the author's name now, but he came up with this idea of the cynical idealist. And that's kind of what John was, where he wanted, 
he wanted us to say, you know, think about something. But for for example, war is over if you want it. You know, mm-hmm. he's not automatically thinking that he is going to change our minds by just saying what's in war. He's saying you have to want to do it. You know, um, and imagine saying you might say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us. You know, he's not automatically thinking that just through his words, you're automatically going to go out there and join the movement. He knows this is something he's, but he's planting this in your mind. And that's really advertising, you know. And of course, the war is over campaign is the biggest example of how he appropriated advertising. I mean, he wisely said, this is a way that we can get our message out there that people can can understand. We're used to advertising. You know, and we're just where Marshall McLuhan comes in on on all this, that we are shaped by media. John thought, all right, this is a medium that we all are familiar with. And so why not use it to communicate a message rather than just sell a product? And so that's what I, I talked about in this article. And I talked about different songs like Give Peace a Chance, Power to the People, even John Sinclair you know, he used these these tropes over and over, and he was really, I thought, that's that's brilliant. I think that's a brilliant strategy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and he even continued doing that uh, even beyond that, his, his sort of radical period uh, in 1974 with the whole listen to this campaign. Absolutely. I mean, he used that. Now, of course, that was a case of, you know, sure, he was trying to sell walls and bridges, you know, right. let's, let's face it. But yeah, he again, you know, what using very simple phrases like that. And I should also add, you know, Yoko played a big part in this because she was and I, I talk about this a bit in the article, you know, she was part of the Fluxus art movement. And in that movement, it was they wanted to separate what they saw as barriers between high and low art. So in essence, they would ask, why shouldn't a piece of advertising be considered the same as a Monet painting? Now, that seems like a pretty radical thought, but that was their whole thing. And that's when, like, you know, they also said that people should uh, help create, you know, art should be kind of created through a group. I mean, that's why, you know, Yoko's cut piece that we all know about, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. where she invited the audience to come up and cut her clothes off. That's a typical Fluxus kind of kind of piece, you know. And she actually, I found out in my my research, in like 65, 66, she did do some artwork that crossed barriers between advertising and art. So this is something she was familiar with, too, and, and that the Fluxus art movement promoted to just to say you can use something that is not considered typically artistic uh, in some ways, like a slogan or or a, a jingle, but turn it into something artistic. So Yoko actually had a, you know, really influenced him uh, a great amount in, in this whole um, uh, peace campaign. And, and we know that, of course, I mean, she she was with them for most of the time with the bed in and so forth. But I think it's important to, to say, you know, artistically. And philosophically, she was a big influence on him in this way. I think she mm-hmm. was the biggest influence on his life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, Go ahead, I was, Steve. I was going to say her whole art, her whole method of artwork, of of presenting her art is is kind of like advertising with the wish tree and the whole that mm-hmm. whole thing. I mean, it's 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 all very, you know, it, it's all it's all in the same boat. You know, it really is. Absolutely. And, you know, and I should also say, though, of course, it isn't, you know, entirely Yoko. John was very influenced by advertising. Biggest example, good morning, good morning. Mm -hmm. What was Mm -hmm. what did he draw the inspiration from? A cornflakes ad, you know, even looking at being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. That was basically, you know, it was an older advertising poster, but that's what it was. In, In many interviews, he talked about how fascinated he was with television. And that sort of thing. So this idea was sort of, I think, planted in his head already. But but when he um, and and uh, when he wrote All You Need Is Love, that was sort of his first foray into using this this kind of, you know, using advertising to uh, to communicate a message, because the lyrics are very simple. You know, when you really just look at them and it's just that chanted phrase, you know, just just constantly over and over. And. Uh, and that was really his first sort of experiment in, in in that kind of songwriting, that kind of slogan 
songwriting. And I know that sounds, as I said, I know this sounds radical to call something like all you need is love a slogan, you know, that mm-hmm. that sounds cold. And, and but but that's basically what it is. And it's something yeah. we all still remember. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and the same give... Happiness is yeah. a Warm Gun was taken from a magazine article or the, the front cover. Right. Of a magazine. Mm-hmm. So. Mm, yep. And, and, you know, and this is an example of, you know, he's trying to, to grab your attention. Now with Power to the People, he grabs your attention right away by that sound of the marching. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, to me, even before he opens his mouth, you know, when you hear that, that marching and then slowly, you know, the, the phrase comes in, but he immediately is grabbing you in kind of an emotional way. You know, as soon as you hear the marching, you're thinking, you know, revolution action, you know, and then he gets through uh, the, the message. But that's typical advertising. I mean, it's it's to somehow grab your attention and connect you emotionally somehow. So you will listen to the message, remember the product, and then, you know, go out and buy it, or in this case, go out and, and participate and, you know, and, and become an activist. Well, and, at, uh, yeah. and as I said, I just think it's smart. Yeah, look at the bed-ins. I mean, that's uh, that, that's another example of, uh, you know, of advertising at its at its peak, uh, really. Um, and it, and it, it also did something that a lot of advertisers would, you know, die for today is it got a lot of attention, both good and bad. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that kind of that kind of thing, too. I mean, they they just had a way of, you know, causing commotion. And a lot of it had to do back then with the fact that, you know, the establishment didn't particularly like the way they were presented. I mean, the, the establishment wasn't real pleased with them. Um, mm-hmm. And there was a lot of criticism in the media, especially because the media was a bunch of old guys, you know. So, well, they were. I mean, you know, uh, I, uh, but uh, they weren't as hip as they are. The media wasn't near, nearly as hip as they are now. But um, and the emphasis on guys, it was right. you know, the, the mm-hmm. media of that That's time right. was That's was true. was almost completely male. There were, I mean, there were a few. Mm-hmm. There was, um, um, in fact, in Chicago, I believe it was in Chicago, there was um, the rock. Rock and roll writer, and I can't remember her name. I think she just passed away too. Oh, I know who you're talking about, and I can't think of the name either. Yeah, right. I, I know who you're talking about. I mean, she was one example. Lillian Roxon was another one mm-hmm. who was who was not a man. Who, who, right, but uh, she wasn't. She wasn't like in the mainstream. She wasn't. The, yes, the, she the, was. the, yeah. the, the the mainstream media was all male. You know, like because really, what you know, what Lillian Roxon was doing at that at that time in the in the late '60s, and what Rolling Stone and Crawdaddy and uh, you know, uh, I and Cheetah and magazines like that were doing that. You know, that was that was definitely alternative. But the you know, obviously the the attitude of the the the, the mainstream media, which was you know overwhelmingly middle aged, mm-hmm. overwhelmingly male, you know, especially with the you know they kept you know kept pointing to you know the naked album cover. I disagree with you a little bit. I think Roxanne was a little more mainstream than than that. I don't think she was totally underground. But uh, but that's I mean that's not that important. Mm. But Mm-hmm. I'm just, but you're, but yeah, mm-hmm. the point, the point that it was guys, basically, it was a male oriented industry at that point. Um, mm-hmm. There's no question about that. So, hey, kid, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, apart from, like you said, creating songs that were, you know, in part slogans and also creating all mm-hmm. these events, bed ends, cutting mm-hmm. your hair for peace, growing acorns for peace. Yep. How different was this than what? people in the folk music scene were doing that were so politically active. You know, people like Peter Paul uh, and Mary and Joan Baez and, and Pete Seeger, you know, and, and creating songs like Blowing in the Wind. And, you know, how different is that from what John think, and Yoko were doing? Yep, yeah, I think John and Yoko were, were I, I, I think they, they really embraced media, television, uh, and advertising. I think they embraced it even more than, as you mentioned, like, you know, Bob Dylan and so forth, because they, they certainly, as you said, they recorded political songs, no question. Mm -hmm. And, and they would, you know, get their message out there. But what, but 
to me, John and Yoko took it a step further. I mean, like, you know, taking out the billboards and 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 even I mean, gosh, when uh, they performed that, uh, I think it was the 69 UNICEF concert and they had war is over, you know, they had a billboard right uh, behind them. They were handing out postcards. I mean, they were outwardly embracing hmm. media. You know, they they made no bones about it. And as I said, and on Dick Cavett. Uh, Dick Cavett show and in other interviews, they said it over and over. And and by the way, one thing I, I thought was interesting, too, was uh, in another interview, um, John actually said he, w- you know, warned from marketing of, of the Beatles themselves. He said, that's what we knew. You know, we saw that, uh, how we were marketed. And and so, you know, that's that's the business partially that we were in. And uh, and so we. Uh, you know, I learned from that, and so I took that principle and applied it to, you know, uh, to our peace campaigns. And I can't recall, you know, really other folk musicians being that blatant about it, you mm-hmm. know, to, to come true. right out. And, yeah, to come right out and say, and then and, and said, I mean, you know, they were, I mean, they even said when when uh, they were doing the bed ins and and other you know uh, bagism hairpiece and all they're saying uh, um, they said we're we're the world's clowns and that's fine if if that will draw people to if we, that'll get us attention and then we can get in our message hmm. and and encourage people to do something we're fine with that and so I think they were really some of the earliest pe- you know artists to embrace that kind of, you know, advertising commercialism with, you know, really not hiding it at all and mm-hmm. and uh, and saw that they could manipulate it, you know, that they could take this existing form and manipulate it to accomplish something else. You know, and that's again, I just I thought that that's fascinating and it's and it was brilliant. I thought it was a brilliant technique. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. You brought up the fact that John became aware of marketing through the Beatles and yet, with yeah. John and Yoko, they appeared on both The Dick Cavett Show and Mike Douglas. And you would think, those are two completely different audiences. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Mike Douglas, you got the housewives <laughs> listening in the afternoon. Dick Cavett was much more of an intellectual crowd, who was mm-hmm. far more yep. aware of, uh, you know, the music that young people were listening to at the time. So those are two completely different audiences right there. Yep, I think, and and perhaps that's another way you can kind of distinguish them from other artists. Is, yeah, they were trying to reach all different people. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. by, by I mean by putting out those billboards. I mean, they they knew everybody would be reading those, so they didn't want to just preach to the choir. Mm. I mean, obviously, I mean, like as you said, the Mike Douglas shows. I mean, some of those shows, they're I mean, they're hysterical because. You know, Mike Douglas looks uncomfortable. The audience looks uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, you know, but that you could tell, though, that was their plan. You know, they wanted to do that. They wanted to be when I say confrontational, I mean, not in a in a overtly, ne- you know, not a negative way, but mm-hmm. to to get their message across and say, you know, I'm challenging you to change your minds. I'm challenging you to think about, you know, think about these ideas. And and, you know, maybe people there thought you know, what a couple of hippie weirdos or whatever they thought at the time. But but it made them think. It made them think, though, about the message. And that's what they wanted to accomplish. And so they didn't, as you said, you know, they didn't just appeal to the Dick Cavett audiences. They wanted to reach out to as many people as they possibly could. Mm. And that's another way I think that they differed from from some of their peers. Yeah, and considering the fact that they were so media savvy, if John was alive today, can you imagine what he'd be doing oh, with the internet and all? I think he would embrace the internet. Absolutely, yeah. he would embrace it. Mm. Yeah, you know, Yoko, and, and, Yoko, Yoko has said that for years that he would have been he would have been a big uh, internet junkie. And I mean, she told me in in the for the first time I interviewed her, she was. She used to. I, I don't mm. think she'd admit it now, but she said that she used to go. Uh, surfing the internet and this was I mean this was you know what I think it was like 12 years ago um, I don't think she would admit that now at all but uh, but yeah she did tell me that back then so mm-hmm. but yeah but think about it you know today's artists do you know they can use mass media and, and well and actually social media I mean that's that is, is certainly a way they 
they reach people. But I mean, John and Yoko were kind of pioneers. I mean, they they were among the earliest artists to, to really understand the power of mass media. But instead of being, you know, controlled by it in a way, you know, they managed to to turn it around and they they managed to manipulate it to their own benefit, you know, mm-hmm. and, and to and as I said, to get their message across. And and I, you know, as I said, I really can't think of many other artists from that time that that grasp that and and they finally mm-hmm. did meet marshall McLuhan. by the way they they finally you know right. did meet and 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 that was an interesting conversation because i think at first they weren't quite sure what to make of him you know i think they thought you know is he is he an establishment you know person but the more they talked they realized they were on really on the same page and marshall McLuhan essentially said to them you know i get i get you you know i get what you and the beatles too i get what you were doing you know, and uh, and so it's a it's it's really, you know, I, I just think it's a fascinating topic. Mm-hmm. Do you think um, I mean, I don't know just offhand uh, about Paul, but would you say Ringo has kind of embraced that idea with the peace and love thing uh, uh, now? That's a good point. Um, and I, I think he has to a degree. I mean, you know, not so much uh, in his music, but he certainly um, appreciated the power of the internet before some of the other Beatles did, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. I, I think before, uh, well, maybe George, I mean, George, you know, his all things was past sight and all that was pretty ahead of its time. But with Ringo, I mean, he really has embraced Twitter. Uh, he has definitely, I mean, looking on his site, how long he's been doing those short videos, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and now that's he started. A, that's, a good, that's a really good point. Really good mm-hmm. point. Cause yeah, he was doing that kind of uh, stuff really before Paul got into it, you know, exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. And, and he really embraced it early on and then staging these, you know, as you said, the peace and love events, like around his birthday and so forth. And, and he really harnesses the power of social media, you know, to get that across. He said, you know, I want everybody to participate, uh, get on Facebook, go on Twitter, use this hashtag at this time. You know, that is sort of the, the modern version. You know, it's the way to, to reach a mass audience, not just advertising anymore. Mm-hmm. Although if you if you notice the uh, I guess the uh, the peace and love birthday events are now uh, subsidized by an advertiser uh, by an airline. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, that's, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> advertising. There you go. Right. There, there you go. There you go. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I no, he ha- he definitely has. I, I kind of wish he would talk a little more seriously about it when he when you when you when he's interviewed because he usually just goes along the same lines well I, you know we do this on my birthday blah 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 and he never really talks like yoko does about his real feelings and you know i really kind of wish he because i'm i i mean i would guess that there are deeper feelings and i at least i hope so and i wish he would talk about that a little more but uh but yeah he's definitely you know become the peace and love guy Maybe even a little more. I mean, Yoko's always been, you know, peace because, I mean, that's part of her website. And, you know, she flashes the peace sign just about everywhere she goes. She did it at the at the love anniversary event, too. But but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, Ringo Ringo's definitely taken that mantle up and and ridden with it. And, he's, you know, it, it's done a good thing for him. It's made him. It's definitely made him a, uh, I shouldn't say made him a person, but it's given him a personality. There, there's what I want to say. So, well, yeah, just... absolutely. And, and the, yeah. And the difference is that, you know, with when John Yoko were, were doing it and, and, you know, using slogans and stuff and, you know, they, they took it one step further and, and communicated, you know, give peace a chance, but then they kind of took a step forward and said, okay, great, you know, flash the peace sign and all, but you've got to do more than that, you know, mm-hmm. and you've got to have the courage to, to, to step, take a step beyond that, you know, mm-hmm. change your mind or, or go out and, and participate in activism, whatever, you know, whatever the, the message was to, to, to take a step beyond that. And, and mm-hmm. that's what a lot of his songs were about. Mm-hmm. Ken, you were going to say something. Ringo has a tough time talking deep about something like this. He's yeah. Not a, he's not a politician. Yeah. He, just, he believes true. in peace true. and love. So he keeps on saying it like a mantra, which is effective in, in and of itself. And any time he posts, he posts any comment online, especially if, if someone passes away, you know, it all ends with mm-hmm. peace and love, Ringo. 
So you keep mm. seeing it over and over again, and hopefully that has some kind of an effect. And, and I do believe if people do think about it together, then something very positive can happen. But he also mm-hmm. does, yeah, that's, yeah. He does that's put true. it in his music, too. Yeah. You know, he had right. Peace Dream, the song Peace Dream. Oh, yeah, that's mm-hmm. true. And he mentioned John in the song. So, and he does sing Give Peace a Chance at the end of his concerts, you know, with, yep. uh, along with, with a little help from my friends. But the one time that he really went a little further with that was that movie, uh, was the, uh, I can't remember the name of the movie now, where everybody talked about uh, Jesus and, and he surprisingly indicated that he that he was a religious person that he believed you know and that was uh, or god when it was god that's what it was about believing in god and that was quite a surprise because he never gave any indication that he was feeling that way and i thought that was you know that was very very interesting that he did that i mean i don't believe we've seen paul do that and john never did that and george of course had got you know had was into kind of the Indian spiritualism, but Ringo, you know, kind of set himself apart. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of interesting that he that he did that. And and you know that that gets gets back to the issue that Ringo, you know, has a great personality, and sometimes he just doesn't let it out as much as as you know you kind of wish he would. Yeah. But, Mm-hmm. You know, Ringo in, in general is, is a private person. He's opened up a lot yeah. more in recent years. He's been mm-hmm. very revealing about himself in interviews, depending upon who's interviewing him. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, you can be religious without really talking about it, you know, keeping right. it private. He doesn't like to impose his views on people. That's right. the, the way he is. Same thing well, with his I mean, political even... views, you know? Yeah, I mean, even if you if you go back to uh, some of the Beatles stuff, I mean, they're the, yeah, they weren't overtly. I mean, they never mentioned God really that I I can think of. I mean, in, in, in Beatles music, but it was sort of a generic spirituality. I, I would say. I mean, it was mm-hmm. it wasn't really pointing out one religion or another. But again, it was you know kind of a similar message of. Yeah, well, I mean, even, in, as I mentioned before, all you need is love. I mean, it was, you know, changing your mind, doing something positive, uh, and Ringo has sort of continued that message. That's mm-hmm. that's true in, in his peace and love campaign. But, uh, but yeah, they, they tended, which was smart, to, to be a little more general, because, well, like I said about John and Yoko, they want to reach the greatest audience, you know, the largest audience they possibly can. And mm-hmm. so that's a, that's a smart way to do it. Okay, we're getting down to the end of the show, so I'm gonna uh, let's talk a little bit about the fest. You you talked a little bit about that before, but you have anything else going on at the fest uh, that you're that you're planning? Uh, well, actually, one more thing is I'm also going to be on the uh, there are two women historians panel. Oh yes, this has been right. We've okay. done, yes, we yeah done that for a few years. It's really gone well, and and so we're doing two of them, uh, two more of them. Uh, one of them we're talking about multi generational fandom, and specifically talk about the impact of streaming media the, when the Beatles finally hitting mm-hmm. streaming uh, sites, how that's impacting the fandom that, that generate a lot of great discussion in New York. So, you know, we're doing it again. And then another panel, we're talking about the legacy of George Martin and, who's, uh, and who's, so on, that who's, on, who's on the panel, uh, Susan, it's sort of ever evolving. So I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think it's uh, Susan Ryan. She's the moderator, uh, Catherine Cox, who is a, a musicologist, um, okay. You know, very, very talented. Uh, me, I think Alison Boron, I think she's going to be on there, who's the editor of, of the online uh, magazine Rebeat. And I'm blanking out there. There are a couple others. Again, it's sort of, uh, you know, Karen, it's, it's Karen, evolving. Karen Dushai. Karen du- 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 absolutely, who is also uh, is a scholar. And uh, so it's it's a great it's it's we represent sort of all different age groups and and mm-hmm. uh, and usually it really amounts to a great discussion. So okay. uh, so that's and, the other thing I'm doing. And when and where is this? The when and where is the fest for everybody that wants to know? Uh, do you want to take that, Al, or do you okay. want to? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> at the uh, at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare, which is a great hotel. Um, yes, it in, is. Uh, in Rosemont, which is right outside of Chicago, but there's a uh, there's a T stop like two blocks away if you're using public transportation. But it's the Hyatt Regency O'Hare, uh, uh, and it's August 12th, 13th, and 14th. 
So basically a little, well, when this airs, uh, it'll, uh, it'll be a little over two weeks away. Okay. Have you got anything else beyond that, uh, Kit? Uh, just that I will, uh, when I'm not doing all this stuff, I will be in the, uh, I think, it, I think it's called the author room. Uh, I'll be there signing books and, uh, you know, and, and I'll have both songs we were singing and Michael Jackson FAQ there. So, uh, so when I'm not doing all this stuff, I will be there. So come and say hi. Okay. I was all just right. going to bring up those two books. So, <laughs> oh, well, thank, <laughs> well, thank you for people you. that don't know. <laughs> songs we were singing tell the folks what that's about uh it's essentially uh it's a collection of the lot of the columns i've done and there's also a piece in there that's exclusive to the book and it's deconstructing different songs in the beatles catalog and i call them deep tracks these are the and what i mean by that is these are the songs that were you know they were either b-sides of singles or were never released as singles uh and these are songs that i think deserve more attention and so I, I take you through this uh, this tour through, I think, these, these songs that deserve more attention. And I talk about, and Ken is always happy about this, solo tracks. What's the Michael Jackson book about? It is uh, all that's left to know about the King of Pop is the um, is the subtitle, and I like to point out this is a different kind of Michael Jackson book. This is strictly about the music. It is about his impact on pop culture, on music. Uh, I cover everything from the Jackson Five up through his death, and even some of the posthumous projects, including we were talking about Love a minute ago. There were two Cirque du Soleil shows done about his music. Uh, mm. I talk about that a bit. Yeah, and one of them I've seen. The other one in Vegas I haven't seen yet. I've got to do that. Uh, the one I saw is the touring one called um, Immortal, which was very good, uh, excellent. And uh, and I, I really take an in-depth look at you know, how he developed his singing technique, how he developed as a dancer, uh, who were his greatest influences. You know, I try to go into these uh, sort of, you know, corners of of his career that perhaps haven't been uh, discussed quite as much. And so, you you know, if you like Michael Jackson, uh, you are really going to enjoy this book. Have you seen both Love and The Jackson Show? I have seen Love. I saw it just a few days after it opened in 2006. I'm dying to see the 10th, the new, the, you know, the how new they changed it. The well, new I gonna, version. I'm, I was going to ask you how the Jackson show compares to the, to love. Uh, the, are, is, are they, are they two different things? Are they basically two, two different things? Well, it, actually not that much. The, now the one in the permanent one in Vegas won. I haven't seen that yet, but the mm-hmm. one I saw was sort of a touring version called immortal. And it was pretty similar. They, they did remix a lot of his songs. Um, mm-hmm. and, and again, it's, you know, everything from Jackson five through his solo years. I wouldn't say the remixes are quite as dramatic as they are, are for the love, uh, love show. I mean, those were some mashups, some reimaginings. Mm-hmm. I didn't sense quite as much of that in the Michael Jackson one, but still, I mean, they do do some remixing um, and, uh, you know, wonderful sound. And it's very dance based, you know, just mm-hmm. like the love show. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's quite, uh, you know, quite impressive. If you, if you like the love show, you would like, uh, well, Immortal isn't touring anymore, but one, I've, I mean, I've heard is, is very much like that. So you would like that show, too. It's a, it's a real celebration of his art. But it also, what's interesting is it doesn't shy away from the fact that he had a tumultuous life. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. they, there are parts of the show that are, in fact, pretty, very sad. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, there are some moments where, you know, about how he didn't really have a childhood and that sort of thing. Um, so but so- the focus is mainly the music. So Immortal is a touring show and not, and not a permanent Right. That one is not a permanent show. The permanent show in Vegas is called One. Uh, Michael and where, Jackson. And where, where is that? I'm trying to remember which which hotel <laughs> that's uh, and I can't I can't even recall which one there that is in now. Uh, it's one I've never been to. It's it's like on the other side of the strip as I as I recall. But it's it's supposed to be very very good. So yep, that's my next trip. I'm going to see Love and One. <laughs> it looks like it looks like from doing a quick uh, search here, it's Mandalay Bay. That's so. right. I knew it was on the other side. Yep. So Mandalay Bay. Okay. Do they have a Michael Jackson mm-hmm. shop there too, like they have at the Mirage? Oh, absolutely. They oh certainly do. It's, it's. Oh my God. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Al, very, gonna, very similar. I should also mention, along with Kit's books, that I 
believe, and she can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I believe this is her 20th anniversary year of doing an internet column for Beetle Fan. Yeah, I shut believe... up, Al. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that old. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get closer to us. Yeah. Yeah, really. really. No, that, that is indeed true. That is, is it? true. It, it was is 96. true. It was 96. I, I can't believe it. I can't believe I've been writing for them 20 years. But yes, yes, I have. This is my 20th year. Because I thought of you this morning as we're recording this. The, this morning, there the news broke that uh, Verizon has uh, basically bought out Yahoo. Yeah, they did. And, oh, and, that was the since, rumor. And since they've already bought out AOL, basically what they're you know going to do is just simply you know chew them up and spit them out. But sure. you know, 20 years ago, AOL and Yahoo were you know were giants mm-hmm. in the in the internet world. And, and uh, sites uh, and and the, yeah. and the sites have changed so much. And I yeah. should say one of the and I know Steve knows this. I've already told him, but one of the very first sites I ever reviewed yes. was your your Abbey Road site. Thank that you. was one of the very first. I uh, absolutely. Thank so you. Uh, yeah, I mean, yep, really. I mean, it was it was one of the first. And and boy, have things changed since. It's just yeah. amazing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. We could we could get into that discussion, take up the whole show. But anyway, yep. I think we're I think we're about out of time. Kit, thank you for being with us again. It's been fun talking oh. to you. And we oh, it's been a, been a pleasure. Okay, and we and uh, good luck with the fest. And Al, you too. Um, thank you. Good luck with the fest and. Uh, you can you can get a hold of us by writing to us and telling us how much you love us or oh I don't know tell us anything uh, at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com we have a Facebook page we have two Facebook pages actually one for uh, the Fab Four radio broadcast and one for the show where you're welcome to discuss the show with us. Um, the show goes up usually around the middle of the week now. It was going up on the weekends, but because of the fact that we have another we have another affiliate that takes the show right away, um, the show's going up now on Wednesdays. So look for it on Wednesdays uh, in iTunes. Uh, Wednesdays or Thursdays. Actually, it didn't go up last week until Thursday. But they're always there on um, beatlesexaminer.podbean.com. If you miss one, they're there forever, and you can you can download them. Ken, um, you have anything to say before we sign off? Well, uh, not only is Kit on this show, but she's been on my show, Every Little Thing, several times. She's been invading my program. Indeed. And Invade. my website. <laughs> I'm taking over. I'm taking That's right. over. <laughs> oh, And okay. uh, you can find more of Kit O'Toole on my website with interviews that I've done with her at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And I'm even giving away a copy of her book, Song We Were Singing. Uh, guided mm-hmm. tours of the Beatles' lesser known tracks, which is part of my mm-hmm. weekly Beatles trivia, so you can win that. And very soon I'll give you the chance to win that book and the Michael Jackson FAQ book on my website, too. So just go okay. to kenmichaelsradio.com. Mm-hmm. Okay. And by the way, we did do, like I said, we, uh, Kit has been here in the past. And if you look uh, up mm-hmm. Kit in the archives, you can find the, the show she did with us about uh, the songs. Uh, the songs they were singing so there we go mm-hmm. um al you got anything anything to, to say before we uh go? just the usual rubbish uh the uh the, the con- you, can, you can contact me on on facebook at al sussman on twitter at asuss 40 uh, 49 or through beetle fan magazine www.beetlefan.com uh, dot com and uh, in uh, in lieu of the absence of uh, Mr. Cozen, uh, you can contact him at uh, on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or his alter ego Alan Cozen remixed. There we go. And uh, I have my own Facebook page, and my email address is uh, by or, or is, uh, Beatles Examiner at gmail dot com. I also have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary where we where we can talk about things that are going on, and you can find my articles now. I know people have been wondering where the hell I went since the examiner went down. I'm on access.com. That's axs.com, 
and I've also had uh, I also had a number of articles this week on both Billboard.com and the Hollywood Reporter.com. Oh, yay, yay. Yay. yay! I know, I know. That's that's been quite. I tell you, that's been quite exciting. Um, but so watch for my and and I will post if you uh, look on my Facebook page or on Beatles News and Commentary. I post the links to the stories that I do uh, as they get published. So there we go. People, it's been great. Again, thank you for joining us, and we hope you will be uh, with us next week for Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, Kid O'Toole, and the uh, and Mr. Alan Cosen, who's out there in the stratosphere. We thank you all for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.